Uh, I know uh, Perry started his kind of uh, DOE uh, it's many years ago and start from GM uh, research lab. So, uh, and I also remember actually, I get to know Perry, uh, it's about 20, uh, at least 15 years ago during one of the sessions uh, <laughs> that I've been mo moderating. So let's hear and welcome uh, Perry and then to hear his insight. Thank you, Perry. Get this all settled here first. Hopefully that's sounding good now. So thank you, Gary. Um, yeah, I was, as you're doing the intro, I started doing the math because you kind of remember years and then you forget the math of how long it's been. So yeah, design of experiments for me started in 86. So that's 35 years, I guess now, something like that. And design of experiments has only been around 80-ish, 85 years. So it's almost half the life of DOE. I've kind of been in touch with it. Um, if you looked at the program for the conference, um, I'm actually, I show up twice. I'm speaking the last segment today um, downstairs, uh, talking about uh, design culture, because uh, the theme of this conference is, is about, um, you know, cultural aspect quality, our, our cultural impacts on the quality systems and behaviors of organizations. Um, so I wanted to do something that was within the theme. And I talked to Gary, and he said, so I was trying to kind of avoid hardcore tool presentation. And Gary said, just do it. I, you should be talking about DOE if you're there. And, and so I said, well, you know what? You know, I want to fit in with the theme, so what, I'll, I'll just put, it, put together two proposals, you guys as a committee, just see how things balance out and work out. And so the answer was I was accepted for both. So um, very, very different themes for both of them. This one, again, more hardcore data tool side. And then this afternoon, more, I shouldn't say touchy-feely, but certainly more on the cultural side. Uh, so, uh, and, and really cool that these are recorded. So it, uh, if, if you do miss that because there's other competing talks, um, you know, you, you still have access to it. If you didn't just hear Andy talk just before me, Andy and I have been friends for a long time, um, similar to Gary. And um, Andy talked to me, I forget when it was, but about the time of the call for papers. And he said, yeah, I was going to talk to this AX, ASQ conference. Can you give me a couple tips? I you know you, you've done this before. I said, well, I'm planning to talk there too, so I'll, I'll certainly give you some tips. So we actually met for lunch and talked through things. And then, of course, we're back to back in the same room at the same time. So we, we kind of have a partnership that I'll take pictures of him and he took pictures of me so we can put that out there and kind of commemorate the, the event. Um, so that's just a little background of kind of like how I got here today. And just if you were in the previous session, I took about a thousand pictures of Andy because. Uh, just kind of doing, doing my role for him, and his talk was amazing. So if you didn't catch it, listen to it. Uh, he told me about it before when we had lunch, and I thought he had some great insights, and, and hearing the talk really brought it to life. I thought he did just a fantastic job. So the, the talk here uh, is uh, called Product Sensitivity Analysis Using DOE. Um, so we'll just we'll get into that. And if you're a process person, uh, this certainly applies to that as well. You'll see that filtered in, but I couldn't make a, I didn't want to make the title too long. I have a tendency to do that, so I shortened it. Uh, it could have just been sensitivity analysis, and I, I really want it to be product and, and kind of uh, manufacturing side. <clears throat> Gary, give you a li little bit of my background. I think the part that's, that's really relevant for this talk from a design or product point of view is that not only do I have my corporate experience, but I also have my consulting experience. And in the corporate life, it was incredibly large projects. Uh, Andy's talk was about Department of Defense projects. Um, I, I worked for a, a FMC locally. Uh, worked on, uh, I think it was, I just call it a billion dollar project, just somewhere over that. Um, just to make two prototypes uh, in about three years. So we were spending some money pretty fast. I had, a, I had a chunk of that, so very large projects, uh, and then went in the medical device world, just physically smaller size, uh, and also just the, the project team and otherwise. And that defense life, 
had a team of 30 in California, a team of 30 in Michigan uh, doing work. And then my customer was actually out in New Jersey. So there's people all over the country and actually over the world that was interacting with. Um, so that's kind of the international, not just in the defense life, but my medical device life. Um, you know, just leading projects, uh, international flavor. But then in my consulting life, uh, doing things not just as a leader, a project manager type, but also as a team member. That's kind of the almost weird, cool part about being a consultant. Sometimes they're like, here's all we want you to do is very narrow focus, analyze some data, set up a DOE, just sit in the corner and shut up unless we need something else from you. Um, but other times they're like, come in, because, uh, and without saying names of companies, but people are wanting to sue each other. We had a, a, an issue in the field. We need a root cause analysis, and we hope no one sues each other. But there, right now, there's more layer, lawyer communication than we've actually had technical communication. And it's actually shutting down the global supply chain for a Fortune 500 company. That's why there was a lot of lawyers talking. So both sides of that fence that I'm able to see uh, in my role now. Again, uh, mechanical engineer, U of M, here locally. When I was at General Motors in Detroit, you couldn't say U of M, because that meant Michigan. So, but here I can say that, because we're in the right context. Three main points that I want to talk through today, uh, starting with the product development flow, what happens in product development. I don't think there's going to be anything real novel there, but just kind of show you where the sensitivity analysis really flows into that. Um, what I've seen, at least in my experience, a lot of uh, design teams and companies really focus on getting what I call a point solution. I want to talk about what that is and what the problem is with that, and then show what the solution is on the design of experiment side. I'm kind of watching my watch here for my timing. So we're going to start with what I'm calling product development flow. What happens uh, is generically or high level as you're developing a product. So if you kind of look at this, I don't think this is going to, this is not necessarily earth shattering on itself. You start with the requirements you have for your, your new product. Uh, you do a bunch of work and you end up validating it and then you, you launch. That's kind of the, the ends of it. And the stuff in between, um, pretty standard stuff that, that organizations do. So you take that requirements list, depends where you get it from, marketing, sales, um, variety of sources. Sometimes it's well thought out, oftentimes really not. Um, it's maybe a wish list or a dream list. Uh, and sometimes engineers kind of blindly just say, well, if that's what they ask for, that's what I'm going to give them, regardless of what it costs. And then you have all that issue. Uh, but you have a requirements piece that's, that's very complex and very uh, challenging. And then you go into Conceptually, concept-wise, what are we going to do for this? Our mechanical architecture, software architecture, electronics, um, sensors, kind of how's, how's this thing going to take shape? And then once you have those requirements and kind of a concept view of, of what it could be, um, that's all on paper. How do you make that come to life? How do you do something with that? So you do some proof of concept testing. You put together some prototypes. It's, it's maybe bench testing plus a little bit. Uh, and if that proof of concept works with your highly skilled 20-year technician, uh, with your precise machined components, uh, everything else, you know, hand-picked electronics, you put that together, it worked. It worked kind of like you thought it would. Because uh, based on the requirements and mess and then the concept options, boy, if this came together, wipe the brow, you know, we're, we're in good shape. And I'm not asking for a raise of hands. We can kind of guess what the answer might be, but how many of those proof of concepts end up, I call, don't jump ahead, but how many times does that proof of concept end up being your final design? And that's what you try and launch. Um, and the whole idea of uh, sensitivity analysis is, yeah, you found that point solution during proof of concept, but how stable is it? Is that from a design point of view, from a manufacturing point of view, is this something that we can, we can do again? Um, so part of that jumping ahead, the parts that get, get uh, jumped, is what are the key variables? 
what are the things that really drive that performance from a, a design point of view and a process point of view? And if you think you know what those key variables are, have you actually quantified it? How do you, and again, the word is sensitivity analysis, but what, what is the impact that those make and what things maybe play together or, or don't play well together that you need to know about your design, your process? Based on identifying key variables, understanding their, their empirical impact or scientific impact, then based on that learning, you can make recommendations now for a final design that hopefully is a little bit more robust, a little bit more uh, stable. Then you verify that in your final design, and then, then you go through, depending upon your industry, I, I do a lot, not only, but a lot in medical advice now, you do your validation stage, but every company has some sort of validation, verification, whatever language, just to confirm that it's working as you expect, and then you go to, to launch. Uh, so again, the, the whole premise here is, uh, while it may look like a lot of steps in between, those steps can be actually very short compared to all the steps getting you to that uh, workable proof of concept. Um, so I'm just encouraging to avoid jumping ahead. And I just have the little, uh, I call it bumper stickers. This applies equally to product or process design. I try and, I can't, as a designer, I really can't distinguish between the two because if you design a product really well but you can't build it, that's not a very good product design anymore. So you really gotta always have both. So language-wise, when I say design, it's always talking about both. This is a, a concept actually, is it, um, just the framework, thinking framework, the title here, Convergent Divergent Concept. Um, I took, took some classes at Northwestern in Chicago, and one of the presenters, or one of the uh, instructors for it, talked about this concept in another context, um, and I thought it really applied well to uh, product development. There's a lot of things we do that are divergent thinking, and then there's things that are convergent thinking. And if we don't identify that, um, I think it really hurts the team. So when you think about the process we just went through, um, requirements is very divergent activity. Reviewing the requirements and driving it down to a concept is very uh, convergent thinking. And they kind of have to happen mentally independent of each other, but to have a successful project, they both have to happen collaboratively, if that makes sense. And some people are better on one side of the fence than the other. A good project manager, and I think I have this trait, can do a little bit of both and kind of blend the teams over those different phases. And so just an example that convergent, divergent thinking, and I actually did a talk t basically totally on that thought process a couple years ago for PDMA. Um, it's on my website, so if you're curious, dig that up or get my card or I get yours and I can send it to you. But the idea of the convergent, divergent thinking is if we've done our requirements and we've gotten some concepts on the table. What I've listed here, A through G, is potential concept options. We can't build prototypes of all those, but just brainstorming-wise, that's, that's what we're thinking of. Again, a very divergent process. Um, and then you may or may not be familiar with a tool called Pew Concept Selection Technique. Um, so now you take those, those several concepts, in this case, seven of them, you don't look at the full set of requirements. You look at kind of the priority top level requirements. You think about the use conditions. Um, what's the user experience you're wanting to get? Um, is this in a, in a human body? Is it in a lab? Is it in a, is it in a desert? You know, how, how is your product going to be used? And you're really looking at high risks. You're looking at the uh, FMEA as an example, kind of a tool that's trying to help you understand uh, those concepts. So you're kind of blending all that together. And that, that technique now, that Pew concept selection is now that convergent piece of we can't look at all seven through the whole design process. We've got to bring that back down again. So let's say of all those seven concepts, we go through this process and we end up with concept D1, and I call it G2. The G2 meaning 
G by itself wasn't very good, but it, you got some ideas from some of the others, and it became a derivative of G. So D1 is the original D, but G2 is a derivative of, of what G was. That's all part of that process, kind of synthesis, um, conversion process. And if you're, anyone's familiar with the Toyota development system, they talk about set-based design. The idea there is that D1, G2 are distinctly different approaches and you want to do a little bit more homework on those. And kind of at the end of that, and not necessarily just pick the winner of those two, you may still blend those two, but D1, G2 needs to be very different. One's not metal and the other one plastic, that's pretty similar. They're really supposed to be independent, very different technologies. Um, and then with the set-based design approach, you, you, again, you're kind of opening things up as you go down that next level of detail. As you go that next level of detail, again, uh, one of those might be a high technology risk. Another one might have some new experimental materials in them. Um, you have fewer concepts, but a lot more details you're exploring. So we, more details, again, we, we diverge. Then we want to, again, through set-based design, end up uh, converging that back down. Uh, the, I think as a keynote today talked about so your decision-making process and your openness to change. Openness to change, I think, is a part looking at these options here, looking at a set-based design, and looking at more details before you finalize that. And, and I'm sharing this because this is stuff I've, I've done with organizations in the past. Um, eventually, though, and oftentimes, um, you know, you want to evolve the technology, you've evolved the technology risks, you rate it down, down select, you need to do the full details, you need to basically order tooling, long lead materials, which these days, everything's a long lead material. Um, but in conventional days, there was actually a time when you, there's only a few things that you might not be able to get quickly. Now it doesn't seem you can get anything quickly. Um, but this would be where you get into the sensitivity analysis and do the DOE, so again, your you're detailing out your final approach, that final concept you selected. And I identified that as D2. Again, we've taken a derivative of that original D concept into blending some of the G2 aspects uh, into it. But D2 now is that final thing we're, we're latching onto. We do some design of experiments work to, to understand it, to, again, under, uh, get that sensitivity in, in critical variables and, and how Actually, they, they play together. So that's, to me, kind of a development process, kind of high level, seeing where sensitivity fits in. But I think this convergent, divergent thought process um, is really important. And again, people that are, are good at the brainstorming and people that are good at kind of bringing things together and they're totally different skill sets. But again, as we showed through that process, there's times when we basically end up with this point solution. We have a proof of concept and we stop there and that's what we're gonna go forward with to, from a production process point of view and uh, we're gonna launch with. Um, I, th I think about it, the, the question I would tend to ask is, do we want to accept this? You know, do we want to accept what we understand now, this proof of concept for the life of this product? Is this the reputation we want as, as individuals? Is this the reputation we want as an organization? Um, and what, you know, do we want to accept this? What are some of those questions or issues? And so that's what this, uh, this kind of uh, list of issues uh, is getting at. Obviously, if you stop at the um, proof of concept level, you're missing potential in the product. That proof of concept is kind of, again, it's almost like throwing darts at a dartboard. You pick something, but is there a potential capability and performance in there? We're not trying to um, you know, totally over-optimize it, but if let's take at least a little bit of time and get a little bit more of the potential out of it. Um, otherwise, we're stuck where we were in the preliminary design or early design point. If we're stuck there, uh, again, it's, it's just, it, it's very limiting. Likely, a point solution like that, a proof of concept, has no stability to it. Um, 
You don't understand stability, which means Murphy's Law says you're going to, anything that can go wrong well. So probably a very unstable performance, very unstable to produce. Um, third bullet, it's probably likely way more expensive than needed. And again, not looking for hand raising, but I'm going to guess the answers we would get. Um, if you've made that first prototype proof of concept, and the machinist took two hours to make your prototype, but in production it's like a 10 minute cycle time, what tolerances did he keep, or he or she, versus what you're going to get in production when you're scaling this up? Um, and you don't know what's important yet, so everything's important. Everything's a tight tolerance, mechanically, electronics, and so on. So most likely that, that proof of concept device is more expensive than is actually necessary to, to perform. I kind of hinted at this already, but can it be scaled? Again, if this is a craftsman, Trying to remember who I was talking to. Oh, now I remember the company. I'm not going to tell you the company, but it just triggered. I was talking to a company recently, and they said, we started this small custom shop, and we do really good work, and we got a lot of great relationships with organizations. And then they say, can you build another one? And can you scale this? Can you do this? You know, can you do, instead of doing one, can you do 20 or 40 of this specific thing? And you're like, no. While if businesses can't scale, you got issues. Um, so if you don't know what's critical, what kind of tooling do you build? What kind of processing speed can you achieve? Um, the whole scaling concept, when you think of proof of concept, it's not just does it work, but can it be scaled? Um, certainly if something doesn't have the stability, um, how, how's that last step of validation going to go? Again, we don't need to raise hands to know that that's probably going to be a disaster. And why do most projects go late? It's not because the design work overextended. It could be. But there's always the shoot the engineer approach of, you know, here's our line, and we're just going to start validation testing, which is kind of dangerous. Um, but if, if, you, if, you, if you have an unstable product and you just draw that line in the sand and start validation, your validation won't go smooth. Um, and that's when projects just keep getting extended. We need to redesign this, reorder long lead parts, rebuild it, retest it. Still doesn't work, why? Because we really didn't know it was important in the first place, and so we loop a few times. Um, early in my consulting life, I did some work with a company uh, that basically had a three-month three redesign cycle if they failed validation. And they said they failed two or three times every time. There's no predictability of the endpoint of your project. Uh, there's no predictability of when the resources are going to be able to start the next project. And again, we don't need to raise hands, but we all seem to face the, this project took longer, the other one's behind. Well, because it's behind, we don't have time for planning, a lot of Andy stuff. Um, we don't have time for sensitivity analysis. We're already behind schedule. We got to get this launched before that, that big trade show. So accelerate everything, don't plan, just run fast. And when we jump steps, we just live with the proof of concept again. Um, and this is more the tie-in to this afternoon's talk. But all those, I'll call bad behaviors, bad life choices, impact your design culture and your behaviors. And so I'm talking more about that particular bullet this afternoon. But think about the practices you have to put in place if this is going on. Are you sensitive to cost? No. Are you really conscious of manufacturing impacts? No. Um, do you really care about uh, reliability? You know, there's a lot of questions buried in here that if you shortcut this, it's, it's making a conscious choice of how your product is going to perform and the impact on your customers. And all that kind of stuff, those behaviors are your culture. Um, and if it, if, and I'm trying to remember who I talked to recently, but someone just said, well, if this is how they behave, they can say they value, I'm not picking on the keynote guy, but the keynote speaker talked about, well, you know what your values are, but if your values and your behaviors don't match, they say they're very customer focused, but we, we ship stuff that we know doesn't work and we'll just figure we'll clean it up later, or if they return it, we'll fix it then. Maybe they won't use that feature that doesn't work. That's, and if you're working in that environment, how inspired are you? 
Are you going to really work that extra hour, that extra weekend when needed, or are you going to cash it in at 4 o'clock on Friday? In fact, I was telling someone, I think it was maybe even Andy, I had a client uh, email me Friday morning, previous client, and worked for them since before COVID. And they said they needed something for basically first thing Monday. This was Friday morning, and I had Friday full. Um, so I set my alarm for, well, I tried to work on it through the weekend and something wasn't clicking, I don't know what it was. And Sunday night came and I'm still not done. I'm just slamming up against that wall. Um, so I finally just, I, I was dead. I went to bed, set my alarm for 3 a.m. Because I promised it, so it was on their desk Monday morning. I worked from 3 to 5 a.m., finished it. It finally clicked. I don't know what it was, about 3.30 a.m., all the stuff that wasn't fitting finally fit, and I sent it to them. They have no idea when I did the work, but they know that they, know that they got what they asked for. And I just think that's, that's a behavior I have. I think that's part of the culture, and that you want that within your team. It's a great group of people. When I worked with them before, they were awesome. If they weren't that way, what if I committed on Friday to getting it done? What if I woken up at 3 a.m.? No chance. But they took care of me before. We interacted very well, very positive experience. So yes, I'm gonna... I'm going to set my alarm at, at 3 o'clock. I forgot this recorded, so now people are going to expect that. Anyway, <laughs> in talking about stability, what is stability? Um, you know, I, I, I think, and I've, I've, been, I've intentionally avoided the word robust design because I've talked about that a lot in the past, but I think sensitivity analysis is a different view of understanding things that are important and how sensitive is it? Do we fall off a cliff or is it a pretty graceful transition in performance? So I think if you look at the base word stability and you think of the word consistency, I think that kind of means something. But again, consistency maybe is a little bit squishy. Think about how stable is your product or process with material variation. Is your pro material pretty consistent or is your material kind of like you know, driving a train through a, through a wall. What about design variation? You know, the ability for certain features to, to move or adjust. And again, think about, again, mechanical, electrical variations. What about stability within, with our process variation? Different temperatures, pressures, line speeds can be such a big impact. Um, because as soon as there's, this is a root cause I did a few years ago, um, because they were having inventory issues, they were rushing stuff through. So I think they were having moisture problems because it didn't dry like it normally would in the, the environment. It didn't stabilize the same way. So just that, that, that cycle time can, can un, unintended impacts. But that's part of your process variation, not just the process itself, but your overall. Do you have inventory? Do they go to the stock? Because part of the issue was then they didn't go to the stock room for two, three days before they shipped. They were speed shipped you know, express shipped out. And then just basic environmental variation. Um, I talk about it all the time when I do classes. Uh, if, if something was built in January, Minnesota, or August, uh, it's a very different temperature and humidity situation. And there's a lot of other variation that's, that's possible there as well. So if you, if you do know those things, um, if you understand all those aspects of stability, you potentially know of places where you can open up tolerances. If things are not sensitive, we can open that up and make it much easier to produce, much easier to fly through the system. Um, you may also learn where you need to improve your process controls. This is critical. Let's, let's make sure and keep our eye on the ball and, and perform well here. So if you understand stability, huge, huge impacts. First one's cost. Second one is keep your eye on the ball, making sure you're watching the right things. So that, again, talks about a, a process development or product development process. Uh, it talks about the issues with that point solution, the weaknesses of it. And I don't think any of us would really consciously choose those things. Just under pressure, we, we kind of make some shortcuts that we've always done, so let's stop always doing it. Um, but how, does, how do we actually do that? How do we actually solve that problem? And I'm talking about design of experiments here as being the solution to that. So it kind of takes a little bit to define 
what DOE is, and actually I'll ask for a raise of hands. How many of you are familiar with design of experiments? So, so everyone's familiar. I tend to have a little bit unique view, so if you're familiar with it, that's helpful. We don't have to go through basic basics, except for the folks that potentially are watching this later or, or remote at the moment. Um, but design of experiments is a tool to identify relationships between multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Uh, a lot of people that are they're trained do it with one output. Um, there's always a second, second output. And there's, again, if you look at your key requirements in that Pew concept selection, a lot of those are opposing requirements. They're fighting each other. So that's one of the big powers of this, is if you can get an empirical equation simultaneously optimized, you're, you're in good shape. For a given test, for a given DOE test, tools are capable of doing a lot more. But it's common for me to see three to seven input variables um, as part of a given DOE. A lot of people, not a lot, but some, some clients call me in. We know it's these two things. I'm like, well, if you know it's those two, you would have found it by now by accident. So if you haven't found it by accident by now, because you should have called me six months ago, I know it's not those two. So we've got to find at least a third one. But then sometimes they're just in panic mode and overwhelmed, and then they, I get a list of like 20 things or 80 things. Usually my actual all potential impact list is 80 or 90 things. If you take a little bit of time, it's at least 20, you know, if you prioritize a little bit. But it's certainly never two. So just getting that list, again, all those lists of things that could, for stability, process, product, uh, materials, there's three right there, and then there's variations within them. Uh, if you have a list of 20, then maybe you do a DOE on materials, design, process independently. If it really is just those three, then maybe you blend them into one. Uh, but three to seven is a good um, window, but also doing it as a phased approach. You don't want to do one big DOE to solve all the world's problems. It tends to have too much noise, takes too much time, costs too much. So you want to break it down strategically. And every situation is unique. There's no rule of thumb really there other than use a phased approach. Uh, the outputs uh, of your DOE really are unlimited. So I say there's a three to seven input window, uh, but the outputs really doesn't have a constraint to it. Uh, I've done DOEs with 20 outputs, because again, we're trying to balance things, and, and if there is a positive impact of, of something, what's that do to line speed? What's it do to cost? There's always some other, let's, let's make sure we're not losing, losing our focus. Um, obviously, as you add output, uh, measurements to your DOE, uh, the, the solution to that becomes very complex. It's, it's a lot less intuitive. Uh, so how do, you, how do you find that sweet spot? And DOE's got a lot of tools to do that. Um, and so these are things I already talked about, but I'll just highlight them because they're here. You know, make sure you're including competing requirements, and there's always a cost trade-off. So you, it's just pretty easy to see that uh, those, those items can grow pretty quick as far as the out, out, outcomes. Um, it's saying that within a DOE, you know, you're not just getting that input-output relationship piece. Uh, I find a lot of people that are familiar with DOE don't do a very good job of what I call residual analysis. It's a, it's a statistical word, um, but it's not, I don't do it because of statistical reasons. I know I have two people, at least two people in here that have been through my DOE training before. Um, I'm inherently lazy. I think every engineer is. You want to find the easiest way to do something, the quickest way to get to your goal, but let's not work harder than we have to. When I first heard about residual analysis in DOE, I go, that sounds like a statistical thing I don't care about. Um, but what I learned is doing good residual analysis, which is a series of steps, um, actual, actually provides additional learning, and that it's, it's super fast and easy to do it, particularly with software these days, and so it's just that little bit extra learning about your stability and, and the sensitivity that you have. So it's not just the input-output and coefficients in the equation, there's another layer of depth that comes through with that. 
So we just established by the room vote that most of you are familiar with DOE, so this little table isn't going to be too novel for you. Um, I'll go through it very quickly anyway. Um, if our input variables are A, B, and C in the table, and we do everything at a two conditions, minus and a plus level, every combination done once becomes eight total tests. And then in the far right of the table, the responses or the outputs are just collected. And I like to show, quote unquote, a typical table with four columns for outputs. I already told you it could be 20 or more, um, but it, most textbooks only show one response. And it's very easy to optimize one response. And none of us have that situation in real life. Uh, so I just, I like to show it there to emphasize there's optimization tools, graphical and numerical, and pretty much every decent soft, DOE software. Again, I give you the window of three input variables, kind of the uh, minimum, seven, kind of the typical practical max. I sometimes have gone bigger, but usually don't. Um, so what I'm displaying here is a very simple case, probably the most simple, if you're trying to understand sensitivity. You could add more inputs and outputs. Uh, the key is you don't have to test every combination. They call that fractional designs. Um, but if, if you were to do what I call conventional testing, non-DOE testing, people wouldn't just do the high and low levels. They would tend to at least add one thing in the middle. And so if you did that, everything evaluated at three conditions. Just this simple case becomes 27 tests. And 27 tests versus eight, and you're actually getting more information out of the eight because of a lot of other low reasons, other than being more efficient. Um, and again, not asking for a raise of hands, but how many of you can interrupt production at any given time? I have an unlimited amount of, of prototypes I'd like you to build. Uh, no, everyone's scrambling. We can't hire workers anyway, so why, why have not built prototypes you really don't need? DOE is a great, great way to overcome that, that resource barrier. So once we do execute that, that test and we've learned what we've learned, uh, and I'm calling it sensitivity information, now we can determine a new solution. We don't have to go with this concept D1 anymore. We have some information where we can, we can evolve that, change the material, open up a tolerance here, tighten it up there, but we're doing it for known reasons instead of tightening everything, because something's important, we're not sure which one. Um, an interesting part with DOE, if you've, if you've done it well, is that you can um, find a solution in between the endpoints of what you actually tested. So we're not testing, we're not picking a solution at minus or plus levels. We can actually uh, go beyond the, the levels we previously tested. And so just, and this is an upcoming picture, yeah. Um, we don't need to select the corners of the cube we tested. Uh, we can pick an interior point, and that's incredibly powerful. And I talked about an example there, finding a sweet spot, but I think the picture will show it, show it a little bit better. So again, how do we find this ideal sweet spot? And I'm just kind of, if you're familiar with DOE, maybe you already recognize this, but it's simultaneous strategic changing of the variable settings, the multiple output measurements. We have a confident prediction to speed our decision making when we're done. Um, again, the keynote talked about it's our decision making process. How, what's our decision making process? If it's loudest voice, that's probably not our best design. If it's, here's some information that's more powerful. Yeah, so it's, it's strategic, yeah. Um, no, but you, you kind of know a window of where you think it might be. And so, and it's strategic in, when I show the cube, I'll explain it better. But part of the strategic is if you're doing all eight corners of the cube and you're going to reduce some of them, which ones you do are strategic from a uh, statistical point of view. If you have kind of a window uh, just of the process or product in general, you're strategic just by talking to the team or the people on the floor, 
How, how does it work when you change this? Is that move quickly? Are we in the right area? Sometimes people look, start to think this in a conference room, and when they talk to people, they go, yeah, we need to open that up, because this is actually what we see in practice or in the field. So, and that's what I mean by strategic is, um, don't just pick min and max your spec range. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, no, it's very, very thought out. And it's not thought out because we know a lot, uh, but it's as thought out as we can with what we currently know. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes I'm trying to help someone set up a DOE, and I mean, I see a potential need for it, and they go, I don't think we know enough yet. I said, if you knew enough to set one up, it's too late. If you know, if you can set up the perfect DOE, you got it now. Um, yeah, if you know enough to set up the perfect DOE, you don't need one because you understand what's sensitive and what's not. So it's going to feel random because you don't really know, but based on our experience and our feel for this. Um, I've, I've heard people, and then other times they said, oh, I don't think we know enough, and I go, well, why? Have you built any prototypes? They said, no. Build a couple and play. And I don't, there's, I, I used to co-teach with a PhD and he was super smart. He used much better words than me. I say play. What did he call it? Um, I'll remember his words later, but he had more fancy words for experimental, ex explore, ex exploratory testing is what he called it. I go, just go in the lab and play. That's, that's, that's more my language with people. So yeah, you want to play a little, but if you play so much where you know exactly where you need to set all those things, that's bad too. But if you feel like you're just random guessing in the dark and throwing darts, play a little first before you, you feel like, if you totally feel it's random, it's probably a little too soon. Does that help? Yep. And again, we're getting this equation. We've done that residual analysis to have confidence in our equation. Now a confident Prediction equation, now can we make good decisions? Absolutely. Um, I don't, Gary mentioned I started my, my DOE work at General Motors um, in, in Detroit at the research labs. I also did a bunch of work in the defense world. Um, one of the, I'll call it the most fun DOE I ever did, was on a war game for a new vehicle for the Army. This was the billion dollar two prototype project. Uh, we actually set up a DOE with the core requirements of that, that vehicle uh, in a DOE setting, and we did it with other technologies too. Um, and if someone goes, well, what if we change this requirement to that? That used to be a week of engineering effort to give the Army feedback on, well, here's the impact that has. We did this war game and this design analysis DOE all together, so any little tweak I could answer in within five minutes of what the impact is on cost, schedule, risk, and performance. And it was incredibly powerful. Our decision making just, because if you can make quicker, better decisions, your projects can execute on time. So I think that covers that. So here's a couple examples. I told you there'd be a cube. So I, I, I put one up for the product side and one for the process side. So let's say it's a, um, you know, there's a couple different materials that we may want to use, a nylon, a polyethylene. There's a feature of some sort. Let's say there's the options of doing one inch or two and a half inches. Again, those are from conversations to get a feel that's the right window. And let's say it's a rotating product of some sort, 1,200 to 1,500 RPM. And we just want to see how, it, how it's working. Our DOE is the red dots in all the corners. Uh, in those red dots, we get data, and we can understand what's going on, predict what's going on in the middle. And again, because we can predict what's going on in the middle, we don't have to pick a red dot for our final design that we showed the up front. We can pick any lo location within that cube, which is incredibly powerful. Similar thing on the process slide, or process side. Um, we have a pressure range, say from 15 to 30 PSI, the temperature other of our oven or whatever the process might be can go from 70 to 150. And again, I put in, we want to see 
how the two materials might be sensitive to those process, process things. So it's a, it's a design feature, the material choice. We want to understand how it affects product performance, but also process reaction to that as well. It's just kind of showing a way to blend them, blend them together. Again, DOE can explore the extremes. Um, and, and from an efficiency point of view, we avoid all those middle values, which I like to ask this a lot of times when I train. How many of you work with perfectly linear systems? I've never gotten a hand in 25 years or whatever I've been teaching. So yeah, we don't work with linear systems. But how many of you over a constrained range? It's approximately linear. There's a lot more hands there. And, uh, I'm almost sad to report that most of the DOE work I get brought in for as a consultant, they're still linear situations. I'm shocked that there's not some weird things going on. Most of them we solve with really basic linear equations. We don't need the advanced response surface tools. Very rare. I use them some, but I probably use them more than a typical company would, and I don't use them but a fraction of the time. They're still useful. It's nice to know they're available, uh, but they're not not cr as critical as you might imagine on the surface. Um, and again, I've, I, on one hand I'm lazy, on the other hand I'm a pessimist. So I do all this work, I strategically set it up as we talked about, I do these corners and I've talked to a million people, uh, I do all this residual analysis, I have a comp, quote unquote confident equation. Um, do I believe it? And my first answer is no. I want to verify my prediction. If I'm going to guess in that gray area, not a red dot, I want to make sure that that actually happens. So I go back and test. I predict what it should be, and then I test, and if they basically match, then it was good. It almost always matches. There's a few times it hasn't, and then you go, well, why doesn't it match? Oh, they didn't have the setting on the machine right, or they changed this and didn't tell us about it. You learn something else. But that verification thing, it, with interpolation, works a lot. So I, I say here it matches quite well. Uh, extrapolation actually works pretty well too. I shouldn't tell you that, but it's dangerous. You really want to verify those. But most of the times, controlled extrapolation isn't so bad either. If it most, I would argue that's in a mechanical system, a chemical system where there could be some weird catalyst effects, things like that. It may not be as good or maybe dangerous, but in mechanical systems, things tend to be pretty graceful and transition pretty smoothly. So extrapolation and predictions um, surprisingly work well. And to give you a scale of that, if you think of that cube, I moved one time basically a cube's distance and predicted, and it was, it was actually pretty close. I didn't think it would be. I thought it would move a lot more than it did. So here's an idea of optimization. Um, it's possible in a DOE. The, and it's a, well, of course, you can only graph two things at a time. This particular one, I show temperature and pressure as the two axes. And then within the graph, we just show a fixture and a material that are somehow normalized. Um, so it's a multiple variable, input variable situation but we're only graphing two uh, at a time because that's just graphical capabilities. I have, for simplicity, two outcomes here, and this was actually a real, real case. But we're going to say that uh, the two uh, diagonal lines are thickness. We know our spec, our spec basically targets 25, but it's plus or minus a half, whatever dimensions that is. So we have those two lines as our constraints for desired um, performance. And then I have a, a curved line in here and I'm saying it's cost. And we have a cost uh, target or t cost maximum of 14.45. The only reason is because that's where the line goes to the graph real nicely for, for this demo. This is real situation but just I've, I've modified the language here. So if this is the whole space that we actually did our t DOE test in, the yellow is what we would call the simultaneous solution. So that's where we meet both our thickness and our cost requirement. And then, and it's blacked out for the details, but you can place a flag in most softwares 
at a point and say, is, that's the interpolation. At that point, what do we actually get for all of our outputs and what were the exact input settings for all those? Um, and of course, if you look from a sensitivity point of view, that big yellow space where we want to operate, we want to operate in the fattest part of that possible. That's going to be the most stable place where we're not near the edge of any of our requirements. And again, I've done these for seven or eight outputs, but for simplicity of viewing it, just showing two gives you the idea. So you can do numerical optimization to think where that point is, but again, that's a point solution just like our, our proof of concept is a point solution. So you do the graphical overlay, which every good DOE tool has. You get this kind of picture. You see, well, our numer numerical was here, but we actually have more, I'll call a guard band, shifted over here. It's a little bit fatter zone. So I use this to kind of adjust from a sensitivity point of view. The incremental cost of doing this to my clients is effectively zero, because you're already looking at it. It's like an extra 10 minutes to play with the graphs and another five minutes to explain it and go, we could be here, but I think here's a little bit safer. Let's go verify it. And it's very, very simple and very, very confident. Another layer depth of, of DOE, um, just talking about the equations. So on the top, I have just one sample equation, generic equation. So Y is one of our outputs. Z is just some offset value. And then big A, big B, big C are input variables. The A, B together is one of our interactions. Then the small A, B, C, D are the coefficients in those equations. So that's a generic form of, of a potential DOE equation containing only one two-factor interaction. You could have more, uh, but I'm, I'm showing a simple version to give the idea of how you can make decisions from these equations. So in the second bullet, I actually put in um, parameters for those coefficients of the equations. Uh, a has a 15 slope, B has an 8 slope, C has a slope of 1, or coefficient of 1, and the interaction also has a coefficient of 8. So if you were to look at that, and I'm going to mumble a little bit so you have time to look at it, what's the key variable there? What's the most impactful, most sensitive variable? It's going to be A. Not just because A has a 15 here, but it actually additionally has an 8 from the interaction. So you kind of, not mathematically exactly, but you can think 15 plus 8 is like 23. So A is moving a lot. B's impact is actually 8 plus the 8. So it's kind of a 16. So it's, a, it's important, but A is a big, big deal. And because of the interaction, you've got to be careful how you set it. Um, what's the least important variable here? C. So C doesn't matter. That's part of the story. What can we do with C? We can open up that tolerance. It's a one, I'll argue, one to 23 impact. One, open it up, save some money. If it doesn't save money, maybe we can have faster lead time or higher yields or there's some way to have some benefit from that. So open it up if you can. A, are we going to tighten it? Depends. Are we going to monitor it? Heck yeah. Do we monitor B? Most likely, depends upon process capability, a lot of other. But can you, you can just start seeing how we make our decisions. Why, why do we need a new temperature gauge on this piece of equipment? Right here, 23x. 23 times the impact of C. C is easier to measure, but we need the instrumentation on A. So stop spending money on Project C because we need it on Project A now. So that's, can you see the understanding sensitivity and how it can impact your decisions and make them quicker? Anytime I've done this and had this kind of detail and then asked for money, you can get 10 or 15 grand in seconds. Uh, you can get, what did I get one time? I think I got 30 grand for a test, just this kind of discussion, in a, just in a heartbeat. There's money flows when you have good information and describe it and show some of those, like the yellow zone graph. They're like, I have no idea what you set up to this point, but I know we want to be in the middle of that yellow zone. That's where we're going to operate. What a great way to communicate and, and move forward. Looks like we've got five minutes and I'm about done here. Um, if you finish your DOE 
and you go, hey, I don't know if we learned enough, we might need to do more. You might need another test to learn more about your sensitivity. You change the ranges of your inputs. You can add a variable instead of A, B, C. Maybe you need D included the second time through. Um, and, or maybe replace less important ones like C in the last example. Maybe add responses or outputs. And then certainly you can finalize the design, confirm it, and then move forward with whatever that, that validation might be. So key takeaways. Uh, so we advance our designs, our knowledge and understanding shapes our decisions. We have very limited, our, our decisions are, are much weaker. Uh, more knowledge means more predictability. We can't have all possible knowledge, but get the big knowledge on the critical things, which is kind of that convergent divergent thing we talked about. If we stop with our preliminary design, the instability causes development delays, big cost impacts, and basically bad decisions. Uh, doing sensitivity analysis well, it's not hard, but doing it well really accelerates the end of uh, development projects. Uh, in the defense world, uh, in the medical world, and now in my consulting life, many times um, is corporate speed records for developing new things, new technologies, challenging new things. And it's a lot of the thoughts that I gave you in here today the development process as well as the DOE process and how to interpret it and look at it, all critical for, for making that happen. So with that, what questions might you have? Go ahead, and I'll repeat it just so it gets on the other. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yep. So my question there is, we kind of added with it, right, and that says that it's proportional, it's not rocket science. Have you seen anybody do that up front, um, the general physics of what you're doing, you know, with the diving board, in the flexion, with the EHQ, that we call it? Yep. No H is in the top. Yep. Yeah, so I think I'm answering your question, so if not, ask me again. If you think you have some science and some equations and you've played with it and confirmed it, then don't do what we've done here. I mean, you have enough knowledge to do a sensitivity analysis. If you think you know it and you do some playing around, you go, we were expecting over here and it's over here. Um, yeah, then now we need to do the extra DOE work. Um, do I know of people that do that work up front I think some do. I would say it's the minority. They, I, I, and that's from my, more from my corporate experience. Obviously from my consulting experience, no one has, otherwise they wouldn't call me. Um, so I don't, they, you know, that's not a good measuring stick, but uh, one of the things I didn't say, my background was I, I taught a senior design class at St. Thomas for three years. So my main role was re, re, uh, recruiting corporate projects for the students to work on. Um, and so I was kind of like a director of engineering watching all the student projects, keeping tabs with them. Um, the great thing about that, because in a corporate world, we're all mature enough to know if we screw up, we know how to hide it like no one else. No one's gonna know that we screwed up and didn't know what we were doing. But we, I shouldn't say we fake it, but we say good stories like, well, there's a supply chain issue, and that's the latest, and actually it was we failed our test and had to redesign. Um, but we can divert attention away from reality. Students don't do that. They panic because they think they're gonna fail and not graduate. So they are just unfiltered. Um, I think it was 27 projects I think I did over the three years there. Not me, but the students did. And I would almost say 27 for 27, their first test of their design all failed. And you think these are students with faculty mentors and they're at the peak of their analytical life and none of the analysis matched the test. I, I don't think one did. Um, so did they do a lot of good sensitivity analysis? They had every tool and, and experienced professor oversight and then, frankly a lot of time because they're students, they have no life, at least that was our attitude as faculty and they all failed. They all failed their first test and their first reaction guess and try again, hopefully we pass quickly. 
Versa, and I, I'm like slamming on the brakes. Slow down. What assumption was wrong? Why was your analysis incorrect? What do we learn from this? And let's adjust that and think about it versus panic and guess and retest tomorrow. So if that's how basically students are coming out of college, I don't think as, as adult engineers, we're much better than that. We just hide it better, my opinion. Other thoughts? How, how transparent is that? Go for it. So software-wise, if you went to uh, jump custom units for most of the work now, or if you were an expert, I'm guessing you're uh, slightly advanced. Advanced dailies, custom dailies. Yeah. Um, you spend the majority of your screen as well. I, the optimal, I optimal? The, the optimals I've rarely found are necessary. Uh, usually a good fractional factorial works. Um, Tool-wise, design expert, jump are both good. Mini tabs, not bad. Um, design expert, just the good. Th I give them all three feedback because I want them all to compete with each other. So everyone's. There. If there's one great one, then they would cost way more than they already do. But if I can help keep their DOE components all similar, and they they fight at each other. They look at each other all the time, so they're all propagating. But kind of honestly, they haven't changed much. The core of what's useful hasn't changed much in any of those tools probably in a decade. They're all, they're all good. But the fr I live in the fractional factorials. If I go advanced, it's box banking or CCDs. The D-optimal, I-optimals, I know about them, I've taught them, um, but I, I evaluate them for certain situations, but I don't think I've ever used one other than in training. Other thoughts? If you want to meet up lunch, I'm staying for the happy hour after, partly because I'm talking at the end of the day too. So I'm going to be here already, might as well have a free drink. So uh, if you want to talk anytime, otherwise email me, ask for a card, drop a card if you need anything. Um, hope you had a good time. Thank you so much. Uh, for your, uh, Thank you. Certificate of appreciation from the section. So. Appreciate it. Thank you.